Graffiti can be a very useful uh, way of honing messages. And my first bit of graffiti was, uh, life is a sexually transmitted fatal disease. <laughs> the next piece of graffiti is that good health is the slowest rate at which you die. <laughs> so you see that this is the background to how long have I got. I was doing one of the things mentioned a bit ago, that is, I was skiing. It's part of being a whole well-rounded doctor, I heard, which was good. <laughs> um, and when one skis, one falls down, uh, and I do fall down. But on this particular occasion, I was knocked down. And I was knocked down by somebody who was out of control. But of course, it, not only was he surprised, but I was surprised. And the outcome was a severe injury to the blood supply to my brain. Now, my helpful colleague said there'd never been any blood going to my brain anyhow. <laughs> but in fact, uh, I was shown my own uh, carotid and vertebral angiograms, and I was horrified. My wife was told by the doctor who was looking after me uh, that I had a 30% chance of sudden death, a 30% chance of severe stroke, and perhaps a 30% chance of getting away with it. I wasn't told that, I want you to know. But after I recovered, shall I say, my neurologist said to me at one stage, you know, Martin, I think your prognosis now is surprisingly good. And I said to him, what the bloody hell does that mean? <laughs> and of course, it actually reflects the, prep, the way that doctors talk to patients about prognosis. When I was a medical student or even a young doctor, we often didn't talk to patients about their prognosis, but we talked among ourselves about their prognosis, and we used words like good, bad, or even a wonderful word, guarded. Uh, I was never quite sure who we were, what, who we were guarding what from whom, uh, but at any rate, those were the words which were used. When I recovered from my injury, I took forward the idea that actually we are all going to die, and that sometimes it's going to be totally out of the blue, but sometimes you have a life-threatening illness, and you may, in fact, want to have some information about the prospects for the future. That was my idea. Was that really what patients wanted to know? And so, together with Phyllis Buter and others, we undertook a large series of studies uh, with patients with advanced cancer, asking them what they wanted to know uh, about anything. And they wanted to know about the uh, chances of benefit from treatment, over 80% wanted to know what was their likely survival. We then audio recorded a large number of consultations. And how often was the issue of prognosis discussed? Virtually never. Virtually never. We then developed some question prompt lists to give to patients, saying, here are some questions that you might choose to ask your doctor if you're having a discussion with him. And amongst these questions were a whole s series of simple questions, and one of them was um, not actually how long have I got, but I'd like to know about the future. And what we found from a large number of randomized trials, audio recording the consultations, that if you give patients a question prompt list, the thing which they most commonly want to ask about is the future. And of course, that is what doctors are frightened of talking about. So the next bit of information which we, I think, contributed to this flow uh, was to look at the survival time of patients with advanced cancer. And together with Martin Stockler, uh, we, we asked oncologists in the institution where I work to predict when 50% of people with advanced cancer that they were seeing, the, uh, the median survival of that person with that disease, 
and we found that the median survival of this population was about a year. Um, but what we also found is that the median was actually not terribly helpful for the patient, because although we were about right for 50, that the median we predicted was in fact the median which was obtained, it didn't actually describe what was needed if we were to talk to the patient about the future. And then Martin Stockler made the very important observation that the survival curve of these patients was pretty close to exponential. Now, I'm not a mathematician, but once you've got an exponential curve, you've got some mathematical uh, issues which will underpin the shape of that curve, and you can start thinking about issues about not just the median, but possibly when the best case outcome might be, when the worst case might be, survival could be. Now, the background to median is that, of course, it comes from following cohorts of patients, sometimes in clinical trials, but not always. Uh, and uh, the term median has been entered into the medical discussion with patients in the last few years. Some of you will know uh, that, in fact, a, uh, that Teddy Kennedy, uh, who you may recall was one of the Kennedy family, who had a brain tumor, and in his assisted uh, biography, he records the fact that his oncologist in uh, Harvard had said to him that with your sort of brain tumor, the median survival was eight months. And he implied in this that that may be what happens to the average or the middle one, but it sure ain't what happens to Kennedy's. And so it was a, a recognition that, in fact, not everybody fits on the middle point. And we have developed over the last bit of time uh, some means of portraying for patients uh, their survival prospects based upon the oncologist's statement of what he thinks or she thinks their median survival or people like them would be. And we have applied modern technology to portray this information. And I'm going to just show you uh, the sort of information which is available and now being used to talk to patients. So this is a, uh, on a screen of, an, of a uh, tablet. And it is based upon the figure given by the doctor of what the median survival of people like the one sitting in front of, of him or her might be. But it shows much more than that. It shows the typical survival. And as you can see here, uh, I hope you can see, uh, we've got a 14-month median survival, but we've also got a best-case scenario, which is longer than four years, and that's the, uh, uh, and the worst-case scenario uh, which is significantly less than that. So the implication of this technology is that we can actually start giving some numbers which patients can understand in regard to their future prospects as judged by uh, an oncologist whose estimate of the median survival will in most cases be based upon the results of randomized clinical trials, but then Randomized clinical trials are, of course, have restrictions on the eligibility of patients for those trials, and they may be uh, different from the, uh, the uh, quality and quantity, sorry, the uh, performance status and the past medical history of the particular patient. And so the oncologist can modify the uh, median survival X uh, statement for the individual patient, and then press the button and use this technology to start talking to the patient about their prospects for survival. The other point to make is that we can press a button and print it out. Now, if you print it out, you can not only give it to the patient, but you can ask their permission to give it to the, their other doctors. So we're removing the inconsistencies, uh, which in fact are characteristic and, and almost typify uh, the information given given to patients about their future. This uh, next slide, I hope, shows the use of this 
uh, tablet to discuss with the patient about their future. Clearly, they can ask questions about it, uh, but they can also have a copy of it to take away. So with this brief presentation, I've moved from a skiing injury to something better than a median survival for discussing with patients what their prospects are. Now, to return to the how long have I got, I understand I had 10 minutes, uh, <laughs> but there is another perspective. When you get to my sort of age, you start wondering whether I might die tomorrow, to which, again, a colleague of mine said, you might die tonight. LAUGHTER